Welcome everybody to uh, one camp conference. Uh, so uh, today's speaker is Tatiana Krishna. Tatiana is a relatively new faculty member, right? Although an old friend, as she did uh, residency here. And med school. Uh, med school. Okay. <laughs> so she went away and uh, to uh, greener pastures, and luckily we have her back here in uh, Institute of Medicine. So today she's going to give us a talk on FC in relation to childbearing women. So, okay, childbearing age. So, thank you, Tatiana. Right. Thank you, Jean, for inviting me to speak. So, you know, the title of the talk is Hepatitis C Among Women of Childbearing Age. And I think there are a few important reasons why it's something that's important to discuss, especially now. Um, as we'll see, the epidemiology of hepatitis C has really been shifting. So, uh, you know, I'll show you multiple studies and reports of how, you know, we're, the baby boomers are not the most, uh, not the group where we're seeing most hep C, it's actually in younger people, and among those are women of childbearing age. So it's important for that reason. The other reason I think it's important, and in general, liver disease and pregnancy is that, well, you know, women of childbearing age can get pregnant, obviously, and when you're dealing with pregnancy, there are two lives affected. There's the mom and the baby. And so when you're dealing with any chronic liver disease and pregnancy comes into play, then, you know, I think it's a, a really a, a time of impact that you should affect two lives at once. And finally, you know, I, I'm interested in this and, you know, uh, some other people here as well because I think that over the past, you know, years, I think there's been a trend to more kind of study of gender medicine and how uh, treatment of certain disease states can be, uh, how there are special considerations in women uh, compared to men in treatment of chronic liver disease and otherwise. So for those reasons, I think it's important, and uh, hopefully I'll demonstrate why. So I have no disclosures. Uh, so the objectives are first to really discuss the shifting epidemiology of hepatitis C in general. Um, second is to discuss uh, hepatitis C screening in women of childbearing age, and in particular, and women during pregnancy. Uh, then I'll, I'll talk about the impact of uh, having hepatitis C on pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. And then I'll also talk about special considerations for uh, care of women with hepatitis C during pregnancy. So in terms of the epidemiology, you know, many of us are already aware of this, that the, the demographics uh, are shifting. So as we see here, this is looking at CDC surveillance data looking uh, back, you know, in the early 2000s up until 2015. And is that pointer? Is that pointer? Or not really? I could also use the mouse. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, we see the top lines are, are the lines of the younger age groups, and so we see, it, you know, starting around this time, there's really an increase in uh, hepatitis C among younger people. So, you know, the baby boomers, the ones that are, you know, 50 to 59 and 60 years of age, those have really remained steady over the, the past decade, but over the past decade, we've really seen an increase in the younger age group, and of course, that includes women of childbearing age. Do you know how, this, uh, how these surveillance studies are conducted? So I think a lot of the CDC is the NNDSS, or the National uh, Surveillance Reporting kind of system. So it, it, is, it does rely on report by, uh, you know, physicians uh, in terms of uh, finding these cases. But, um, you know, so it's, that, that is a limitation, but clearly there's a trend. But of course, you know, this could also reflect increased reporting and reporting bias. But I think by this point, we've accumulated so much data that, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. And we have a reason for it, too, as we'll see. So, oh, maybe it just keeps turning off. Um, and so this is actually specifically looking at New York State. Uh, and this is data from Department of Health, and basically it's looking at the trend in time of hepatitis C, uh, again, hepatitis C reports, and we see, you know, back in 2005, there's really one uh, peak here, and that's in the baby boomer age group, you know, 40 to 60. Then as we move, you know, almost uh, seven or so years later in, in 2012, 
we begin to see the second peak developing in the younger age group. And then as we move to 2015, we see that these peaks uh, sort of begin to even out. And now, you know, most recently in 2016, we really see an, uh, a larger peak in that uh, younger age group. So this is uh, men and women. The darker lines are female, the orange line is men, but we really see an increasing uh, prevalence of hepatitis C uh, in this younger age group. So why is this happening? I, I think, you know, by now we, we understand pretty well that this is largely in relation to the national opioid epidemic. And uh, we see here this study uh, published in 2014, again, looked at trends over time, uh, particularly in, uh, in young injection drug users. And we see that the incidence of acute hepatitis C is really increasing. Um, and we see that there, there's more darker red here than there was here. And uh, over time, there's really been a regional doubling of uh, her uh, heroin users. And uh, this is particularly pronounced in younger age groups. So when they evaluated these uh, patients with, you know, by asking them, a vast majority of them initiated drug use before age 20. So they're starting very young. And um, actually, a lot of them also report a history of prescription opioid abuse. So many of them are starting with prescription opioid abuse, and then that turns into injection. And of course, uh, injection drug use is what puts them at risk of um, uh, acquiring hepatitis C. And subsequently, this was published just uh, this month. Uh, you know, again, that this connection between opioid, the opioid epidemic and hepatitis C is really being made. So we see here, this is again the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, like I mentioned before, the NNDSS. And this is again national statistics looking from 2004 to 2014, over a decade. And again, we see increasing numbers of acute hepatitis C in general. And also they looked at admission to substance use disorder treatment facilities to see if that uh, increase over the same amount of time parallel the increase in acute hepatitis C. So we see that from 2004 to 2014, uh, the percentage of admissions to these substance use disorders that were from uh, opioid use uh, increased over time, which parallel the increase over here. And they compared the demographics. Obviously, they didn't look at every single patient to see you know, which patient had the opioid admission and which had the hepatitis C, but the demographics were very similar. And clearly, the trend is there. And they went further to look at it on a state level. And you know, this is 2004, this is 2009, this is 2014. And over time, on a state level, the number of admissions to uh, the substance use disorder programs and the number of uh, acute hepatitis C cases reported, there is an increasing positive trend over time. So you know, again, bringing home the fact that this acute, this hepatitis C uh, increase, and especially in these younger patient populations, is largely a result of, of really this opioid epidemic that over the past decade has kind of ballooned out of proportion. So among these young people who are opioid inject, you know, and injection drug users are women of childbearing age. And similarly, there have been reports in particular uh, about women of childbearing age. So we see um, this is one of the initial reports that's frequently cited. This was published in 2015, where the CDC reported an almost 400% increase in hepatitis C infection rate related to injection drug use among persons uh, age under 30. And uh, among those, uh, more than 50% were women. And, uh, you know, in a lot of these reports, you hear a lot about the Appalachian region and those states listed there, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, is where this opiate epidemic is especially pronounced and you're seeing really high rates of new hepatitis C infection. So that was one of the kind of, I think, original reports that really got people very, very concerned. And then subsequent to that, um, or in addition to that, there was also, particular in New York State, a report that 58% uh, of all uh, new hepatitis C cases in women, or the majority, were in women of childbearing age as opposed to the baby boomer age group. So the majority of female cases reported are, again, 
in the younger age group, women of childbearing age. And then in Wisconsin recently, there was a report uh, published in 2017 where there was an 81% increase in hepatitis C detection, again, in the, this young age group. Um, and 43% of those uh, new hepatitis C infections were in women. And in the study that I had described in the prior slide, where uh, they looked at national trends with the substance use disorder programs and hepatitis C, there's a fourfold increase in acute hepatitis C among women and twofold increase among men in this young age group. So it seems that the rates are increasing more in women than they are in men. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, that you know, there's a lot of uh, needle exchange programs being done. I, I haven't seen any studies specifically looking at um, you know in this recent epidemic whether the needle exchange programs have made a difference. I think in a way it's kind of still recent, but I do know there's a lot of emphasis on on building those programs you know around the country and especially in the Appalachian region. There's a lot of work. Yeah, also Vancouver. Mm -hmm. It could be social reasons why young people who are in remote areas, I guess that's one of the shocking things about this epidemic, it's a, it's a rural epidemic, it's not an urban epidemic, yes. so needle exchange programs aren't quite so successful. Right, yes, and um, I know that, you know, there are efforts being made, like, and um, there's Judith Feinberg, who's in West Virginia, and she uh, is working actually on, you know, basically going to these very remote areas and establishing these programs and, you know, driving for hours to get there. But I think, you know, it's it's going to take a while to really make a big impact. Um, so this is a study that was published, uh, you know, earlier this year in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it looked, again, at national rates uh, using Again, the NNDSS case uh, reports, but also using laboratory data from Quest, where they evaluated, you know, hepatitis C positive tests in the national laboratory database. And you know, I, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. But again, we see that um, starting in 2012-2013, that the rates that are occurring in this younger age group of 15 over 44 is surpassing the rates that are occurring in this 45 to 64 age group. And so the number of acute cases uh, in this study increased by almost fourfold in women of childbearing age. And, um, you know, again, since 2012-2013, the rates occurring in younger women of childbearing age are higher than in the baby boomer age group. And so then, you know, the question becomes, it, you know, many of these studies say that in particular it's women of childbearing age that are affected and that the rates are increasing more in women perhaps compared to men. And so the question is, uh, is the risk of hepatitis C infection actually higher in women who inject drugs than men? And this is a meta-analysis that looked at uh, reports of hepatitis C, new hepatitis C infection across uh, different countries. So you know, really across the world to see if in injection drug users rates of hepatitis C infection actually are higher in women than in men. And the overall uh, statistic shows that the odds ratio is 1.36. So women were 36% more likely to be infected with hepatitis C than were men. Uh, and this, again, is among injection drug users. Uh, and, you know, the, it varies by country, but overall it seems that uh, when you pull all the data together, women are more likely to be infected than men. So there have been several studies that looked at actually why women in particular may actually be at higher risk of hepatitis C infection as a result of injecting drugs than men. And there are a few uh, reasons why this may be the case. So. Um, Women who inject drugs actually have been shown to have higher incidence of HIV and injection-related risk behavior. So there are higher rates of equipment and syringe sharing in women than men. So, you know, if we have safe uh, syringe programs, then women should really be targeted because for uh, whatever reason, they engage in higher risk injecting behavior. 
Um, they're more likely to use injection equipment after their male partners, and uh, women are more likely to be injected by others than to inject themselves. Um, they also, women are more likely to have uh, partner, sexual partners who are injection drug users. So again, you know, this overlapping sexual and injection partnership uh, increases the risk, then, uh, the risk of hepatitis C from injection. And then also, uh, another study showed that women who inject drugs face uh, stigma and they may be less likely to participate in harm reduction services. So they uh, may not actually uh, you know, want to participate in programs that would reduce the risk of them acquiring hepatitis C. And so then we've talked a lot about this younger age group and women of childbearing age. How about hepatitis C among pregnant women specifically? So again, reports have shown that rates of hepatitis C among pregnant women have been increasing over the past two decades. And again, this could be related to increased testing. So I think as providers are becoming more aware of the opioid epidemic and, and just uh, hepatitis C in general, now that hepatitis C, there are more treatments available and I think it's more in the public eye, maybe there's more testing. But in general, there has been more detection of hepatitis C in pregnant women. Um, and the more rapid rise since 2006 parallels the increase in incident infections among women that are of childbearing age. Um, and uh, during 2011 to 2014, hepatitis C detected among women of childbearing age increased by 22%. Uh, and then also uh, uh, hepatitis C testing among children increased during that time as well. And I'll show you a graphic of that. And then uh, birth certificate data show that percentage of infants born to hepatitis C infected mothers increased by 68% um, from 0 0.19 to 0.32% nationally. So we begin to see that the issue with hepatitis C among women of childbearing age and women during pregnancy is that there is a risk of potentially mother-to-child transmission. And so we have two patients that are affected by this. I'm, I'm sorry. Does that imply that birth certificates indicate that an infant is actually positive? I don't understand the last point. No. No, I, I think... It, I think they just used the data to look at, I think, the number of infants born and then percentage, you know, compared to the percentage that tested positive versus negative. Yeah. So this was a study that look, used a large database, the nationwide inpatient sample, and looked at rates of infection reported from 1998 to 2011, and they looked at HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. And again, you know, of course this can uh, reflect increased reporting, but um, you see that the hepatitis C has really increased over time, at, you know, more so than the hepatitis B, and he HIV has declined over time. And so there's an average of almost 5,000 cases of uh, hepatitis C per year in pregnant women. And they also found that uh, maternal hepatitis C was higher in patients who are drug users, not surprisingly. Uh, patients who are HIV positive uh, have other substance use, and also women on Medicare and Medicaid. And, you know, to summarize, there's a five-fold increase in hepatitis C uh, from 1998 to 2011, reported in this nationwide sample, um, you know, over time in pregnant women. And this study, uh, this report looked at uh, national trends, and I had already mentioned a little bit about this. It looked at national trends over time, and also trends in Kentucky, which is one of those states in the Appalachian region. And although the bottom lines look pretty straight, there is a gradual increase over time, but we see a much more dramatic increase in Kentucky. And what we see here is that the bottom line is women, and the top line is children. And again, although we don't know that necessarily that this reflects mother's child transmission, it highly suggests that the parallel increase in detection in children occurred at the same, you know, rate as the increase in, uh, in women, particularly in this region of the country. So I think this uh, 
is a bit concerning because, you know, is there anything that we can do to prevent this? And, you know, these children are being infected potentially at birth. And uh, we'll, we'll hear more about, about what, what the next steps they think should be. And this map looks at, uh, again, pregnant women in, in the U.S. in 2014. And we do see, you know, really a, a regional difference in, in rates of uh, uh, hepatitis C among pregnant women across the country. And again, the, this region, the Appalachian region, where, you know, the very dark states, it's about 23 per 1,000 births. So this is, you know, almost at the 5%. And, and when speaking with, you know, some, some colleagues in that area, it's about 5% of births are uh, hepatitis C positive. I also recently heard a statistic that in the U.S., every 40 minutes, one child with hepatitis C is born. So it's really sounding, it, it's becoming really kind of a, a, a big national issue, and in, in particular in, in this region, of the country is almost unbelievable to what degree uh, this opioid epidemic has led to so much hepatitis C among the, uh, among the mothers or the children? This is among pregnant women. So this, this is not looking particularly in children. Um, you know, but I showed you that other kind of parallel increase in Kentucky specifically. So, you know, as we'll see, the, the cited risk of transmission from mom to child is about 5%, but those numbers may be higher. And when speaking with some of the people working there, they really think that the numbers are higher, just that there may be underreporting. Uh, but we're seeing a lot, you know, these very high rates among pregnant women, which of course puts their children at risk. It's amazing. Tennessee, Maine, Vermont, Montana, states, mm -hmm. the, the anti-urban. Yeah, anti-urban. And yeah, th this is looking specifically at Tennessee, where you see a lot more black if you look at the county level, that certain counties are especially affected by it. So it's really pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. And of course, we're in New York City, but I, I also did mention that in New York State, um, you know, that the majority of new infections are among uh, women of childbearing age. Um, so, you know, I don't think we're spared, but it definitely does seem like it's more of kind of a rural epidemic, but it is an epidemic. So. Uh, and then New York State actually has taken, uh, uh, you know, an interest in this and is focusing on this. So these are two posters from the New York uh, State Department of Health about pregnancy and hepatitis C. So this one, you know, if you are pregnant and living with hepatitis C, talk with your healthcare provider to be sure you and your baby get the care that you need. Um, but I think the majority of, you know, and at least what we're seeing is many are actually just being diagnosed during pregnancy. Uh, so if you have ever injected drugs and you're thinking about getting pregnant, get tested for hepatitis C. But I think that women are not overly enthusiastic to tell their OB provider at their first visit that I injected drugs, as <laughs> Dr. Sperling probably knows. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if this, this actually is necessarily helpful, but... Uh, you know, the, the idea is that New York State is taking an interest in this and in, hope in uh, decreasing the, the rates. So what are we doing in terms of um, pregnant women and hepatitis C? So the current guidelines for screening during pregnancy is risk-based testing. And these, these are the recommendations by, you know, the Liver Society, the GI Society, the CDC, and the OBGYN Society. So all, everyone agrees at this point that uh, risk-based screening during pregnancy is what needs to be done. And so this includes this list of categories. So women with a history of injection drug use, uh, which they may or may not admit, but if they have a known history of injection drug use, you should screen <coughs> the hepatitis C during pregnancy. Women who are HIV positive. Women who also snort drugs, because that also is a risk factor for hepatitis C, so you screen them. History of blood transfusion before 1992, uh, patients who are on dialysis, patients who have a history of incarceration, uh, patients with history of unregulated tattoos, and patients with you know, abnormal liver enzymes or any sign of liver disease, and also patients who are seeking treatment in sexually transmitted infection clinics. So this is the current recommendation for, for screening during pregnancy. 
And I think the expected question is, or at least in my mind, is universal hepatitis C screening during pregnancy, would that be beneficial? And I think uh, when thinking about this, there are definitely pros and cons for implementing a universal screening program. So, uh, you know, to go over the pros, the, the potential benefits of doing universal screening during pregnancy, uh, I think we've established in other disease states, and as I've already mentioned, that risk-based screening is problematic and not effective, especially during pregnancy, that women during pregnancy, study after study has shown, are really unlikely to report uh, or are likely to underreport any history of high-risk behavior during pregnancy. So it really may not be very effective. Um, so I would say that risk-based screening is outdated. So in the past, you know, the only treatments we had available for hepatitis C was interferon ribavirin, which were very contraindicated during pregnancy. So in a way, why would you screen during pregnancy if there's no treatment and there's nothing that you could do about it? Uh, but now, as we know, we have a lot of new uh, treatments available, which may potentially be safe during pregnancy. Um, I think another benefit to uh, implementing universal screening is that it really aligns with other infectious disease testing recommendations during pregnancy. For example, with hepatitis B, you know, we screen everybody for hepatitis B during pregnancy, not just those people that are at high risk. And I think it makes it simpler um, and exactly operationally simplest. And finally, the, obviously, universal screening compared to risk-based screening would identify the most uh, hepatitis C-infected women. So if you want to you know, change the epidemic and link these women to care, the most effective way to do that is to screen everyone because, again, uh, they're very likely to not report risk-based uh, behavior. But I think, you know, we also need, to, obviously, you know, I think I made it pretty obvious that I, I'm a, I would be a, a proponent of universal screening, especially in the face of the shifting epidemiology of, in, of hepatitis C. But I think there are also potential downsides. So currently, uh, today, there is no existing measures to prevent or reduce uh, the risk of um, mother-child transmission. Well, there's pregnancy recommendations, but the, uh, the use of directly acting antiviral agents is not currently approved for use during pregnancy. Um, there is a false positive rate, so it's about 3%. So, you know, if women screen and they have false positive rate, then, you know, mothers can become unnecessarily uh, worried and anxious during pregnancy. There are potential costs uh, associated with uh, universal screening. So, you know, if we screen everyone, that will obviously be more expensive. Uh, you know, I think hepatitis C is not necessarily a pregnancy-specific disease, and so uh, why screen during pregnancy? You should just be screening at, you know, in general or at other times. Um, and then, you know, some op opposers would say that it's a relatively low transmission risk to the baby, so uh, do you really need to screen everyone if chances are the baby will be okay and not be affected? So here at Mount Sinai, thanks to uh, the work of Dr. Sperling and uh, Dr. Dietrich, um, you know, we have implemented universal screening for all uh, patients seen in, in the OB clinics at Mount Sinai, and we'll be expanding to Mount Sinai West. So we are screening um, all patients during pregnancy. And then also, uh, yeah. Who controls that decision? Was it just that I wrote it that you could decide, uh, or was it a student or the state? Or? No, I could decide for three days, but so the only thing that we have control of would be the people who have to be the Okay. How would you, and I guess, how would you implement that at the state level? I mean, I would assume that's. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that just like all the other infectious disease screenings that are in our state mandated, you could turn it to the CDC recommended, APOC endorsed, and state mandated. So for us, it's What would the sequence be to collect the data, show that there's an unmet need, and then go to the state? Or you it's please make the argument now? No, I think the argument is usually coming, it's usually driven by the CDC and her, so they make recommendations to professional organizations and go back to American College of OBGY and American Academy of Pediatrics and usually so it's done by the, by the states. I think that we're there in terms of having the discussion. Okay. I think that the discussions are there. I think that the, 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 the 
joint task force between HRSA and the CDC that's going to make specific recommendations to enforce universal screening and signing its way through the, the policy of it? Sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I get the sense that it will be implemented on a national level, maybe within the year, but hard to, hard to, it's, it's in the works, but we started here first. <laughs> and then um, Pani has a project, Stomp C, which actually is offering screening to non-pregnant women who are seeking care at OBGYN practices. Mm -hmm. And then women who screen positive are referred to us. So uh, uh, Dr. Sperling has the OB Infectious Disease Clinic, and I'm starting the Women's Liver Clinic. And so all women who screen positive, they have a place to go and to be evaluated and to count, be counseled on risk factors. So even patients who just um, have positive hep C antibody and negative RNA, we still see them and we counsel them about risk factors and uh, you know tell them that just because you may have had it once and cleared it doesn't mean you're uh, protected to get hepatitis C in the future. So risk factor counseling is very important. Uh, we also focus on uh, testing partner and the other children. So for example, recently I saw a patient who screened positive during pregnancy. This was her fourth child. She had three kids. We recommended that she test all her other three kids because we don't know when she acquired it. And we really couldn't identify any risk factors. And one out of the three kids tested positive. And this was a 10-year-old. And she had no, not only did she have no idea that she had hepatitis C, she had no idea that her child for 10 years had had hepatitis C. And there's currently no approved treatment for children under 12 years old. So we referred the child to uh, pediatric hepatology. And so, you know, at least uh, they're linked to care. And, you know, I think if we hadn't tested during pregnancy, I don't know that she would ever, or the child would ever find out. And so we also work closely with Dr. Posada, who is pediatric infectious disease. And we, in our protocol, we have follow-up arranged for the child who's at risk of transmission at four months and 18 months of age for uh, laboratory testing. So the screening, is it currently opt-in or opt-out? During pregnancy or? For the non-pregnant patients. It's opt-in. It's opt-in. So they're offered screening, and if they are, and, you know, and we have Kate, who's here as well, our social worker, so she meets with them and discusses, you know, tells them about what hepatitis C is and their potential risk factors, and they can opt in to testing. So what, what do we know about hepatitis C care in pregnancy? And I think there are a few questions. One is, does pregnancy change the disease course of hepatitis C? Another big question is, is there any role of treatment of hepatitis C during pregnancy? But even before that, does hepatitis C have any effect on fertility? Uh, does having hepatitis C in the mom influence risk to the, to the newborn? And uh, importantly, what really is the risk of mother-to-child transmission? So in terms of fertility, I think this is still uh, being studied, but there have been a few studies which have uh, have found that hepatitis C may decrease fertility in women even in the absence of advanced fibrosis. Uh, in addition, sperm count motility and normal morphology can be significantly decreased in men with hepatitis C. And, uh, but then there was uh, another study which said that despite these uh, potential issues for a couple seeking IVF, their outcomes are really no different uh, if men are hepatitis C infected. So the data is really mixed, but potentially there's a signal. And um, you know, hepatitis C discordant couples may have lower implantation and pregnancy rates compared to age match controls. Um, and recently, just uh, earlier this year, uh, there was a, a large study done by Erica Villa in Italy looking at this and evaluating whether, um, whether fertility in women with hepatitis C is affected. And in the study, that there were three cohorts. She had a prospective cohort. Uh, which she evaluated and compared them to uh, compare patients with hepatitis C to those with hepatitis B. And also, uh, in addition, two cohorts where she did a large retrospective evaluation. And uh, what, what she found actually was that there was premature ovarian senescence in women with hepatitis C, which re resulted in fewer live births, higher rates of miscarriage, and higher rates of gestational diabetes in women with hepatitis C versus those without. And uh, also the total fertility rate in women who are hepatitis C positive 
was decreased. And miscarriage rate, uh, although it's higher in women with hepatitis C, if you, for those women that they looked at retrospectively who had been treated for hepatitis C, uh, the miscarriage rate was reduced. And uh, this graphic, uh, you know, was in the paper, and it looked at hepatitis C positive women versus negative, and they found that the levels of anti-malarian hormone in women with hepatitis C was lower than um, than those with uh, without hepatitis C, and again, these higher rates of complications as a result of this premature ovarian senescence, uh, including miscarriage rate and other complications. So even before pregnancy, hepatitis C may have an impact on um, on fertility, and there may there is a role for treating, obviously, before pregnancy. And then in terms of the effect of pregnancy on hepatitis C disease, I think the data is really not that strong. I mean, we know that pregnancy is an altered immunologic state, and that, uh, you know, for example, for hepatitis B, there's increased risk of hepatitis B flares. But I, I don't think it's entirely clear with hepatitis C with, whether pregnancy affects the disease course, as in, you know, uh, makes the disease progression or fibrosis progression quicker. But I think uh, that's something that we can look at in the future. And then, as I already mentioned, you know, there are these potential impacts on pregnancy and women with having hepatitis C. And I think the one that has been most studied and really confirmed is that of cholestasis of pregnancy. So there was actually a large population-based cohort study in Sweden where they matched women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy to women without and found that there's a hazard ratio of 4.16, so significant association in uh, women with hepatitis C uh, with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. And then there was also a meta-analysis done of all studies, of, um, of a number of studies of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy with hepatitis C, and they found an odds ratio of 20.4 of, um, of cholestasis of pregnancy in hepatitis C-infected pregnant women versus not. And their conclusion was that occurrence of intrahepatic cholestasis pregnancy should be an indication to investigate whether the patient has a hepatitis C because of this very strong association. I think the mechanism of that association is still not entirely clear, but at this point, it's uh, pretty established that there is a very strong association. And Dr. Sperling has been screening women with cholestasis pregnancy for hepatitis C, you know, already, even prior to universal screening. And then shifting gears to mother-to-child transmission. So again, you know, there have been, uh, you know, pretty large studies looking at mother-infant pairs and with uh, hepatitis C. And the general number that's cited is around 5.8%, uh, 5, 5 to 6% of transmission from uh, mother to child. And we know that likely the level of uh, viremia in the mom probably is associated with risk of transmission similar to what we see in hepatitis B, but the exact threshold has not been established to date. And in terms of uh, transmission of hepatitis C, there, uh, the thought is that the majority of the hepatitis C transmission occurs uh, peripartum, but up to 30% can occur antenatally. And uh, postpartum, very rare that uh, there would be transmission. So this study actually looked at specifically that to see, you know, when does the hepatitis C transmission occur. And basically they looked at 54 infants that were born to hepatitis C moms. And what they looked at when they tested positive uh, in terms of HCV, PCR, HCV RNA. And they found that although uh, about 30% tested positive very early on, the majority, you know, 50, 79% um, <coughs> tested positive, or 37 of them tested positive after the first three days, and the conclusion was that the ones that tested early, um, likely the transmission occurred in utero, but the ones that only became PCR uh, positive later on are the ones that occurred peripartum. So the, the thought is that the majority of transmission really happens uh, peripartum. And in terms of other risks associated with transmission, the really the main one is HIV co-infection. So women who have hepatitis C and are co-infected with HIV have a much higher risk of transmission. This one particular study found, it was a very small sample size, only eight HIV positive women, but they found 25% risk of transmission. I think the more commonly cited number is closer to, 
really at least double of what mono-infected uh, transmission rates are, so uh, about 12 to 15 percent. Yeah, this was 20 years ago, so, or at least the one on the left. Yeah. Uh, so how effective was heart therapy, and is it related to HIV viremia? You know, I'm not sure if it's related to HIV viremia. I think, from what I understand, it's just complexion with HIV. But I'm not sure. Anna, Rhoda, would you? I don't know that. Yeah. And then in terms of other factors, in terms of pregnancy uh, specific delivery related factors that may or may not increase transmission, so several studies have, or a number of studies have looked at C-section versus vaginal delivery. You know, in the past it was thought that C-section would decrease the risk of transmission, but really looking at all these studies there has been uh, really no association between mode of delivery. Um, then looking at invasive fetal monitoring, uh, there are three large cohort studies that looked at this, and although the strength of evidence is not excellent, uh, there possibly one study showed an increased risk of, you know, with an odds ratio of almost seven of uh, increased risk of transmission with invasive fetal monitoring. And then uh, prolonged rupture of membranes as well um, has been found to be associated with increased risk of transmission. Uh, again, postpartum related breastfeeding does not seem to uh, have a have an increased risk of transmission, and generally the recommendation is that breastfeeding is safe and should not be discouraged on the basis of hepatitis C. But in general, you know, other than minimizing invasive invasive fetal monitoring and prolonged rupture of memories, there really has been no other intervention that has been clearly demonstrated to reduce the risk of mother-to-child transmission. And uh, this year, or you know, in 2017, the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine actually came out with guidelines as to pregnancy care specifically for women with hepatitis C. And uh, this is a list of the, the recommendations. You know, they recommend uh, risk-based screening, as we had already discussed, um, recommend that um, patients should be, you know, counseled to abstain from alcohol. And number four, I think, is interesting. They recommend that DAA regimens only be used in the setting of a clinical trial during pregnancy. Um, so, not currently recommending treatment during pregnancy. Um, we suggest that invasive pre prenatal diagnostic testing is required required that um, amniocentesis is recommended over CVS because there's just not enough data on CVS. Recommend against C-section solely for the indication of hepatitis C. Uh, recommend that if such a care providers avoid internal fetal monitoring, prolonged rupture of membranes and episiotomy. And then uh, the one with the strongest data and the highest quality of evidence is that of breastfeeding. Uh, and that says that we recommend that obstetric care providers not discourage breastfeeding based on a positive hepatitis C status. And then in terms of hepatitis C in infants, um, passive transfer of antibody uh, occurs from the mom to the child, and, but there's a gradual loss by 18 months in the child. So the recommendation is if you're testing with antibody, you don't want to test before 18 months in the child because prior to that, it's transferred from the mom. Um, and then uh, RNA-positive infants need further testing, linkage to care, and, and virologic monitoring because obviously they can go on to develop chronic hepatitis C. And these are some statistics in terms of what happens to babies who are infected at birth. So it's thought that about 20% of them do clear the hepatitis C, 50% uh, become chronic asymptomatic, and 30% chronic active. And in those cases, there can be very rapid progression to cirrhosis by the time they're, you know, in their adolescence or, uh, you know, pretty early on. And then in terms of other outcomes, there have been studies that have suggested that uh, there's increased congenital anomalies, low birth weight, um, and potentially adverse neurologic outcomes. Other studies have looked at 
uh, children who, you know, when they're a little older and acquired hepatitis C at birth, and they have sight increased cognitive deficits and attention uh, attention disorders and things like that. But I, I think, you know, at this point, it's more reports than very well studied. So, uh, but it's not surprising that there may be some extra hepatic manifestations in, in children from having hepatitis C that are not just the disease. And in terms of the follow-up, so, you know, this study was done in Philadelphia and, and by the Department of Health, and we know that mother-to-child transmission is the most common route of infection in children, so a majority of children who have hepatitis C, not surprisingly, get it through mother-to-child transmission, and this study looked at births in Philadelphia, and basically they found almost 600 births to hepatitis C positive women. They looked, and they ended up evaluating a little over 500. And of those 500 infants that were born to moms with hepatitis C, only 16% were ever tested for hepatitis C. So this really is, you know, this is in Philadelphia, but I, I, I think it's not uncommon around the country that oftentimes there's no follow-up for children. The mom may be diagnosed with hepatitis C, but then there's no established follow-up for the children, and they potentially are never tested. And so then when they, you know, by the time they're age 20, they may have really advanced liver disease. And this was actually just uh, earlier this year, that, um, again, on the CDC uh, site, they actually published a case definition for perinatal infection to help uh, physicians know what, what qualifies for uh, mother-child transmitted hepatitis C in the infant and, and, that, and, you know, really recommend reporting that. So I think there's an increased emphasis on trying to identify uh, these children and report them and then obviously link them to care. And if they do uh, get hepatitis C through mother-to-child transmission, what can we do for them? Well, so these are the ASLD guidelines and basically, you know, the first statement is if the AA regimens are available for a child's age group, treatment is recommended for all children older than three years as they will benefit from antiviral therapy independent of disease severity. However, uh, the only uh, regimens that are currently available are for children that are over 12 years of age or weighing over 35 kilograms. So currently, there are no DAAs that are approved for treatment in children under 12 years of age. So, you know, if they do acquire through mother-to-child transmission, they have 12 years of having hepatitis C without treatment, which, you know, when speaking with moms, they find it very unacceptable. Yeah. I can just say sure. that the first studies were done and we are part of a national study on younger kids and actually there are already good reports and actually in the FDA probably they going to be approved for younger kids yeah. and still patients that are positive they are the option to another option to enroll to other studies that are being done uh, with the different medication uh, like a cruiser and, mm -hmm. and so and others so there are still options for patients if we can enroll them and in the very near future, I think that we're going to see uh, younger kids that can get this treatment with our money and mm -hmm. uh, so forth for your battery. So Sorry, Alan, three, three years old. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Yes. Uh, on its way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of pregnant women, so ASLD recommends against treatment during pregnancy. So, you know, the, the Women of childbearing age should be targeted, and, and there's a benefit of cure before pregnancy, uh, but there's no recommendation for treatment during pregnancy. So I think, you know, to end, you know, when we're thinking about potential opportunities to reduce mother-to-child transmission and the question of treatment with uh, directly acting antiviral agents, there are really three clinical scenarios of women in pregnancy. One is a woman who is planning pregnancy, who has hepatitis C and is planning pregnancy. Second is a woman who is pregnant and is already on antiviral therapy. And third is a woman who is pregnant and not currently on treatment. And uh, I think the considerations uh, vary between these three groups. And, you know, I think it's a unique setting where you really have to balance the risks and benefits to both the mother and the baby. So you have to think about two patients at play when making these decisions. So when you're speaking with women who are planning pregnancy, they're women of childbearing age, um, you know, I, I think uh, it's important to target these women and, and tell them that if you can potentially delay pregnancy and we can treat you uh, and cure you before you become pregnant, then potentially we can minimize mother-to-child transmission and obviously cure hepatitis C in you. And one important caveat to remember, though, is that ribavirin-containing regimens, which for the majority of these women would not be necessary because they're early fibrosis and, um, 
you know, majority genotype 1A. Um, but if they are in ribavirin, they have to wait longer to become pregnant. So six to even maybe 12 months for the washout period for ribavirin because it's uh, teratogenic. And so um, just one consideration to make. But the idea is that you really want to prioritize these women and get them cured before they become pregnant, if at all possible. And then if a woman comes to you and she uh, is already on, on DAA therapy and then becomes pregnant, which even in clinical trials, you know, there, this occurs that uh, women just become pregnant, um, then I think the counseling that should be provided at this point is, well, obviously if they're on ribavirin-containing regimen, um, you know, it's category X, so you may choose to terminate the pregnancy. Um, but if they are on a DAA regimen, then I think the recommendation at this point would be that the safest thing to do would be to stop because you really, you know, in early pregnancy, that's the period, the first trimester, where is the potentially highly teratogenic period. And so if they become pregnant while they're already on the DAA, they're in their first trimester, and you really would like to minimize that risk in the absence of having complete knowledge on the safety of these medications. Um, so this I already covered, and you know, a, a consideration to make is if a patient's already on treatment and they become pregnant, there are certain groups that are at high risk of transmission if they're HIV co-infected or highly viremic, or if they have cirrhosis, which would be rare to see in the pregnancy setting, but you may have the discussion of whether there is a benefit to continuing, but again, I think those would be pretty rare cases. And then if they're pregnant and not currently on treatment, but they're diagnosed with hepatitis C during pregnancy or, uh, you know, have known about their diagnosis and become uh, pregnant, the, question, the recommendation is, you know, by both ASLD and this is the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine that we recommend that DEA regimens only be used in the setting of clinical trials during pregnancy. So no real recommendation. However, um, you know, Dr. Dietrich and, and uh, colleagues back in 2015 actually wrote this editorial in Hepatology which looked at the safety of a lot of these DAAs and as you see many of the DAA regimens, these are not the most up-to-date list of what we have available now, are category B. And so we use many medications that are category B during pregnancy. So currently, you know, there are no published studies on the use of antivirals to prevent mother-to-child transmission or the use of uh, during pregnancy. But um, there is currently actually a phase one trial going on in Pittsburgh where they're uh, actually recruiting patients during pregnancy, second and third trimester, and treating them with Harvoni. So results are still not available, but uh, there is a trial being done currently. And I think there's more to come. Um, personally, you know, I, I've had an, an interest in this as well, and I think that there are uh, potential benefits to treatment during pregnancy. And, and uh, when I was at UCSF, we conducted a survey of women with hepatitis C, as well as women who were seen at the hepatitis C treatment clinic, and then also women in the Women's Intern Agency HIV study, which uh, all of them were HIV co-infected, to ask them if they were pregnant and would they have an interest, would they find it acceptable to take treatment during pregnancy. And we see here that, you know, the majority of the patients answered yes. Um, a slightly higher percentage of patients with advanced disease cirrhosis answered yes. And those who had known uh, perinatally acquired hepatitis C in their children, even a higher percentage of those patients answered yes. And speaking currently with our, um, you know, women's liver clinic and, and OBID clinic, the women that we are meeting who are diagnosed with hepatitis C, the, you know, what I hear most is what can you do to eliminate the risk to my baby. I mean, patients are really, really interested and almost don't even want to hear about the risks of the treatment because they just want to do anything possible to prevent any risk of, of transmission. So with antiviral therapy during pregnancy, I again think that there are certain pros and cons or potential benefits or downsides. So I think a really important potential benefit is that we can prevent maternal hepatitis C disease at a time where they're engaged in their own care. Um, oftentimes for these women, this is the only time that they'll be seeing a doctor regularly. This may be the only time they have health insurance. So this may be really an opportune time to treat them. Potentially, it can decrease mother-child transmission. 
uh, again, when they're uh, engaged in their own care, you can cure them and then decrease further community transmission among the, these high-risk patients. And then, you know, it's an opportunity to cure them before their next pregnancy so that uh, they, at their next pregnancy they won't be at, at risk of mother-to-child transmission. The downsides are that um, DAAs have not been fully evaluated during pregnancy, so anytime I think that we discuss any medications during pregnancy, there's always a safety concern. DAAs are expensive and potentially difficult to access efficiently at a, you know, in a time-sensitive way. Um, and then many would say that women should just be treated either before pregnancy or after pregnancy. Why focus on pregnancy? And again, about children, uh, many say that children could be just treated later and mother-to-child transmission is relatively low. So what are we doing here? So here we have actually implemented a hepatitis C treatment protocol. Uh, this is relatively new, but basically every patient that we see that um, screens positive for hepatitis C, we have a discussion with them about what we know about the hepatitis C medications and potential uh, risk versus benefits of treatment during pregnancy, and, and we make a de decision with them. And if they are agreeable, we do um, we uh, do actually offer them treatment. And so far, we've had one patient. Um, and then we, again, also have pediatric follow-up in place for the children who are born to these hep C positive moms. And we have linkage to care for these uh, women because, you know, they're seen by us, and then I could follow them after pregnancy as well. So, uh, to conclude, you know, I think the, the epidemiology we've seen has really shifted, and because of the opioid epidemic, we're seeing a lot more hepatitis C in young people, and this includes women of childbearing age and women that may be uh, getting pregnant. And so, I think universal hepatitis C screening, especially at this time, uh, can be very uh, helpful at identifying and, and linking to care more women with hepatitis C, especially if we're speaking about viral eradication and trying to, you know, get rid of this problem. This is an opportunity. I think. And then, um, you know, we, we're seeing that hepatitis C has a negative impact on pregnancy outcomes. So uh, the idea is treatment before pregnancy would be great, but potentially treatment during pregnancy also can uh, benefit pregnancy outcomes even. And um, antiviral therapy during pregnancy, I think this is a new concept, and but it may potentially be eventually, uh, you know, similar to hepatitis B, a guideline recommendation of treatment during pregnancy for prevention of mother-to-child transmission. They, I think there's going to be more to come in the in the coming years. That is all. So, I want to acknowledge Dr. Dietrich, Dr. Sperling, Dr. Friedman for hiring me and <laughs> and allowing us to to build you know this women's liver clinic because I think it's really really exciting that we're doing this at a time where the epidemiology is changing and I really think this is a very timely and important. Uh, thing that we need to emphasize now. And then also Nora Tarot, who was my mentor at UCSF, who helped with some of these slides and also was very encouraging about, um, you know, st studying viral hepatitis during pregnancy. So that is it.